Good afternoon. I think it's afternoon. Yes, it is. Um, I'm Trevor Morrison. I'm the dean, and I'm really thrilled to welcome all of you here for what promises to be uh, a really interesting conversation. Um, our speakers, Strive and Tom, will be introduced formally by Sufti in just a moment, but I, I want to tell them both uh, myself how grateful I am uh, that they've uh, devoted time to being here with us today. Special thanks also to the Robert Bernstein Institute for Human Rights and our Leadership Mindset team, uh, which have worked together uh, to put this event on today. Um, we are, as I say, extremely uh, grateful and excited that uh, Tom Bernstein and Strive Masayua are here with us today. Um, there, you'll hear more about them from Sukti in a moment, but they both, among many things, uh, serve on the advisory board of the Bernstein Institute here at the law school, and we have benefited tremendously uh, from their wisdom and counsel as we have launched the Institute over the last couple of years. In fact, the idea for the Institute uh, came from Tom Bernstein, as many good things in the world do, uh, over lunch at Chelsea Piers about two and a half years ago, and it's uh, remarkable to think about how far we've come. Um, today's conversation about leadership in business and in human rights, I hope, will uh, underscore the sense in which that's not an odd pairing, and how we can think about uh, leadership in these two spaces, and indeed the synergy between the two, um, not only think about it, but to see them working together uh, very vividly and concretely in the careers of Strive and Tom. Um, now to introduce Sukti, who will introduce them. She's the deputy director of the Bernstein Institute, uh, a fantastic human rights advocate in her own right. She's been with us less than a year, but it's hard to imagine um, the law school without her, so that's a sure sign of indispensability. Um, really uh, glad to have Sukti as part of the team, and I'm pleased to turn things over to her now. Thank you so much, Trevor, and uh, can everyone see me over, I'm short, so I hope you can see me over the podium. Um, my voice is loud, though, so. Good afternoon, everyone. It's really, really exciting to be here today. Um, as Trevor mentioned, my name is Sukti Dithal, and I am the Deputy Director of the Bernstein Institute for Human Rights, and we're really thrilled to be one of the co-sponsors of today's program. Um, I'd like to take a second to just also thank our co-sponsor, uh, the Leadership Mindset here at NYU Law, which brings together members of the Vanguard to the campus to illustrate powerful leadership concepts to students. Um, it's a signature initiative, and it encompasses intensive training, specialized programs, events, mentorship relationships, and other exposures to ethical, diverse, and inclusive leadership concepts. And I think today's conversation is really emblematic of one of the programs that the Leadership Mindset believes in. Special thanks to Claire Whitman, who, has, uh, who serves as a leadership um, initiative coordinator, and Anthony Thomas, who's unfortunately not here today, but is director of major gifts here at the law school. Um, they're both um, in their individual capacity and their teams have been working very hard to make this gathering real. So thank you very much. Um, and when the prospect of hosting a conversation between Tom and Strive emerged, both of our, um, our teams were really, really excited about, about the possibilities. Um, it's an opportunity to hear from two incredibly smart, successful human beings. Um, who, off, who are also business leaders and who share not only a wonderful friendship, as we'll see, but really a deep commitment to philanthropy and human rights. Um, there's a saying by Buddha that comes to mind when I think about um, the way in which Tom and Strive had led, have led their lives. And it says, if you knew what I know about the power of giving, you would not let a single meal pass without sharing it in some way. Um, and as we talk through their introductions and the conversation that precedes it, you'll see that both of our distinguished guests um, really do understand the power of giving. So to begin with, I'd like to welcome Strive Masayua, who is the founder and executive chairman of Econet, a diversified global telecom telecommunications group with operations and investments in over 15 countries. Uh, the company operates in the core areas of mobile cellular telephony, fixed public networks, and internet and satellite services. Um, Strive's been involved in the development of Africa's independent media, 
as well as a host of other business interests, including renewable energy, financial services, and hospitality. Um, he serves on a number of, of international boards. Um, these include Unilever, Rockefeller Foundation, the Council on Foreign Relations Global Advisory Board, the Africa Progress Panel, the UN Secretary General's Advisory Board for Sustainable Energy, Morehouse College, Hilton's Foundation Humanitarian Prize Jury, and the Kenjin Tatsuchin International Advisory Council. He's one of the founders with Sir Richard Branson of the Global Think Tank, the Carbon War Room, and the founding member of the Global Business Coalition on Education. Uh, he took over recently the chairmanship of the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa and is chair of the Micronutrient Initiative, a global organization focused on ending child hunger and improving nutrition. Uh, about four years ago, five years ago, Stry was invited by then President Obama um, to address leaders of, the, of Camp David's G8 summit on how to increase food production and end hunger in parts of Africa. He's a member of the Giving Pledge and his contributions to education, health, and development have been widely recognized. Strive and his wife Tutsi uh, finance the Higher Life Foundation, this is incredible, which provides scholarships to over 42,000 African orphans. Um, in two, 2015, he was a recipient of the International Rescue Committee's Freedom Award and was presented with a UN Foundation Global Leadership Award for the work of, of Africa Against Ebola Solidarity Trust. I could keep going on and on and on, but I just want us all to just sit and, and kind of absorb that. Um, and there will be a lot more conversations that follow. Um, not to be outdone, we have Tom Bernstein with us, um, who is the president and co-founder of Chelsea Piers, a 30-acre waterfront sports village along Manhattan's Hudson River. He's also chairman of Chelsea Piers, Connecticut, and was one of the two principals of Silver Screen Management, um, which was affiliated with Silver Screen Companies, and from 1983 to 1998, financed 75 films with the Walt Disney Company, including some of my favorites, um, Beauty and the Beast, Pretty Woman, and The Little Mermaid. Um, Tom was also one of the principal owners of the Texas Rangers Baseball Club, with the ownership group led by George W. Bush. Previously, Tom worked as an attorney in the entertainment law department of the firm Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton, and Garrison, and served as a law clerk for the Honorable Jack B. Weinstein in the Federal District Court of New York. He's a graduate of Yale Law School and Yale College. And over the past 30 years, Tom has taken a leadership role in a number of organizations which are focused on human rights, citizen service, and the arts. In 2010, President Obama appointed Tom as the chairman of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, uh, where he has served as a member of the Council and Executive Committee since 2002. He also holds numerous chair positions, including Vice Chair of Human Rights First and Chair of the Human Freedom Advisory Council of George W. Bush Presidential Center, Chair of Cities of Service, and Chair of Partnership for the Public Service in Washington, D.C. Tom also serves on the board of the Center for Civil and Human Rights, New York Public Radio, City Year in New York, and as a member of the Advisory Council for NYU Stern Center for Business and Human Rights. He's also been, as Trevor mentioned, integral in establishing human rights fellowships and institutes at law schools. He helped launch the Orville H. Shell Jr. Center for International Human Rights and the Robert L. Bernstein Fellowships in International Human Rights Law at Yale Law School. Most recently, Tom helped establish the Bernstein Center Institute for Human Rights at NYU. Um, and for that last one, I thank you because it allowed me to have a job. So thank you, Tom. Um, and jokes aside, as you can see, Strive and Tom share a limitless passion for business leadership and human rights. And it's really an honor for us to listen in today on their conversation as they share reflections and ideas on really building a career that fuses drive, dedication, and service. And so without further ado, I please help me in welcoming Strive and Tom. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sati. I'll, I'll get us started here. And um, for me, this is a real privilege uh, uh, because um, Strive Massasiwa is, is a really extraordinary person. And you can see, just listening from Sufi, he, is, uh, he does more things than most 
uh, humans could ever dream of. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's uh, Strive and I have been friends probably now for 10 years. And we've traveled the world together. Our families have traveled the world together. Um, today is a special uh, uh, occasion because he has five daughters, and three of them are here with us uh, today. I can tell you that doesn't happen very often. And Sarah on the left is a junior at NYU. And um, Joanna is up at Yale, just finishing her first year. And Tanya, is, she's um, long graduated. And um, she's, uh, she's the, uh, she, 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 she keeps, keeps the sisterhood together. And uh, I can tell you, having watched them, it's not often you get three of them in the same room. So we're really glad you're here. Um, and uh, this, uh, with all uh, of the things that Strive has done, what, what I marvel at and um, think is his crowning glory is that with his wife, Titsi, he has five fantastic daughters and a son, Moses, and um, uh, just a, a family that has more spirit and love than, than you can imagine. So it's, it's, we're going to talk about, today about Strive in the business world, in the world of philanthropy, and some of his thoughts as to you know, how we can all uh, engage uh, in, in different ways, but it all starts at home, and uh, what he and TC have with their kids and their family are really an amazing next generation to carry forward everything that they've uh, started. It's impossible, really, to do justice uh, to an introduction to Strive, although Sutti did a pretty good job, but you get some sense of just all the things that he has taken on. and. Um, so I was going to mention a few of them, but then I, I uh, also, my wife, Andy, um, sent me this morning. I don't know why. She, I do know why she sent it to me. And um, she, the Fortune uh, magazine just put out a list of the 50 most influential leaders in the world. And of course, Strive is one of them. So um, you, can, you can get very hyperbolic about his many contributions, but we're, 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 I'm not the only one. And the other person on that list, which is a great testament um, to NYU, is Brian Stevenson. And actually, my wife, Andy, has been, who's not a lawyer, has been auditing his courses. And so all of you who know Brian and his work, uh, re really amazing. Which brings me, before I get Strive going here, to say a word about NYU and the Institute here. Um, as was mentioned by Sukti, I was Yale undergrad in Yale Law School. I did practice law for a few years, have been involved with what we used to call the Lawyers Committee for Human Rights, now Human Rights First, for 35 years. And um, I, I marvel at NYU Law School. I, I think, and I've got, I knew Ricky Rivez quite well, and, and Trevor and I are great friends. And um, now watching Trevor and Sukti and others set up this institute, and Sharon, who's worked with my dad, Bob Bernstein, for many, many decades, human rights in China, it's, it's an amazing place. And, the, um, and, and you know, uh, uh, I hope the Bernstein Institute will uh, uh, sort of take all of the uh, already very deep and diverse human rights engagements at, at the law school and the university and just and help bring it together and take it to a new level. And of course, who helped make this possible? Strive Masaiwa, when we were putting it together. Uh, uh, strive, as he always does, uh, is there to help. And so, um, and now we have Massey Ewer Bernstein fellows who, when they graduate NYU Law School, go and um, uh, get entry level jobs at human rights organizations here and around the world. And the whole idea, of course, is to launch careers in this field. And um, so, we're uh, yet another reason uh, to be uh, grateful to Strive. Um, one last thought here. We had the uh, uh, initial dinner for the Bernstein Institute here. I lose track of time. Some, sometime within the last year, Sh Sharon was here and, and others in the room. And as I'm sitting up here, I'm thinking back. My dad, who's now 94 years old, uh, was seated here. And who came in in the middle of the dinner and then joined him where Strive is? Natan Sharansky. And interestingly, my dad first met Natan Sharansky when Sharansky was a 28-year-old uh, 
uh, friend and protege of Andrei Sakharov in Moscow. And when my folks went to Moscow in the mid-1970s, and they were just started the United States Helsinki Watch Committee, where they went to see Sakharov, the reason they met Sharansky was he spoke English, and he was really their tour guide. This is before, this is when he was Anatoly Sharansky, before he became the, so they've had a lifelong uh, friendship and have worked together, and um, it, was, it was very touching to, uh, to see them uh, together here. So anyway, so well, I thought we'd do a few things today in, in having uh, Strive's precious uh, moments with us. And again, the problem with Strive is this really shouldn't be a lunch, it should be a semester, a, a course. <laughs> And well, I'll leave that to Trevor to work out and to, because if you want to get a sense of all the different uh, 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 things that he could tell us about, it would, it would take a lot more than the, the, the time we have today. But I wanted to, uh, uh, I thought he could uh, talk about two things in particular. One in the business sphere, how he started Econet, which has now turned into a massive global enterprise. But the early story in Zimbabwe, and it's not that long ago, if, if Strive, if I have it right, it's the mid-1990s. And I've heard you know, parts of the story, not all the story. It's amazing. It, you know, it all seems sort of so obvious now. It was anything but then. And his first battle was a major legal battle. It was a constitutional battle to get the right to go into the mobile cell phone business. So that's, so, um, that's number one. And then today, Strive, there have been many businesses in between. But today, Strive is launching yet another business, and he's all in, and I've watched him go at it for the last couple of years, and it's Kwesi Television, and it's bringing massive sports and other programming to the continent of Africa, as never done before. So I thought Strive, um, we'll start with that, and then we'll talk about a couple of the philanthropic um, uh, uh, efforts, which again are endless, but I will focus on a couple. Um, and, but let's start with the business, Strive. And just t t a little, especially with your girls here, you know, I mean, they were, I don't even know who was born then, but I rem you know, this was, tell a little about the early days of starting a business. And, um, you know, there was that film, um, uh, Down and Out in Beverly Hills, uh, here. He was down and out in Harare, as I recall. Uh, anyway, say a little bit about that, Strive. And, and, then, and, then some, and then the legal issues that were involved as you, as you went to, as, as, you, as, as the battle was joined. No, uh, thank you, thank you, Tom. And uh, thank you for those kind remarks. Uh, you know, it's always a great pleasure to be here. Uh, some of my finest times has been traveling with Andy and Tom. Uh, and uh, some of his work with the Holocaust Museum, we went to Auschwitz together. Uh, and uh, we just... So that is. And we went to Rwanda together. We went to Rwanda together, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, going back to, if, to, to those early days, you know, you don't wake up and say you're going to fight a constitutional court battle against the uh, government of Robert Mugabe, uh, not to be tried too many times. But uh, what, what basically happened is. You know, these were the early 90s. And all African governments in most countries around the world, telephony was considered sovereign domain, done by governments only. So I went along to the government and I said, you know, I have this idea. There's something called mobile phones. Uh, and I would like to set up a telephone company. And they declared me public enemy number one um, you know, I, just as a joke, you know, the other day uh, somebody said, you know, they now think you're an agent of, of French uh, uh, intelligence. And I thought, well, you know, what, what a demotion. I used to be CIA, <laughs> Mossad, <laughs> British. Now I'm just the French. I mean, <laughs> obviously times are changing. Uh, but we ended up uh, being accused basically of being really uh, subversive agents. And, but I sort of soldiered on and realized that the only way to be allowed to operate was if we went to court and to challenge the telephone monopoly. And we went to court. 
And after two years, uh, we successfully uh, man, uh, challenged the monopoly, but we lost the court case. That was what year started? That would have been about 94. So we lost the court case over whether or not the state had a monopoly. And um, then somebody called me and said, you know, have you read the section in the Constitution on freedom of expression? Why don't you mount a constitutional battle over freedom of expression? And we had an incredible uh, jurist who was our chief justice, who came from the Zimbabwean Jewish community called Anthony Gabe, who was very, very smart. And they said, you know, this is the kind of thing that Gabe has been waiting for. You've got to challenge him on this. So I they said, but you've got to take on the government. So we mounted a constitutional court battle over freedom of expression created by the fact that you have a monopoly in telecommunications, but only 1.4% of the people have access to the telephone. So we said this, the, the telephone is ubiquitous to freedom of expression. So we had to first get Gabe to accept that as a principle. And like all constitutional courts, it took us about two years to get him to hear the case. So they heard it as a full bench and issued an order that the telephone monopoly be unwound. And of course, most of the African countries borrow legal frameworks from each other. Uh, and our legal framework was based on British legal framework, which meant that the ruling riveted through the Commonwealth because they shared the th So there were a lot of them then forced to go and rewrite the telecommunications law. And so that led to, but of course, the government of Zimbabwe, you know, threw their toys out of the cart. So for another two years, so it was to take us five years, uh, we were in and out of the Constitutional Court. And eventually, uh, we persuaded the Constitutional Court that they could license us that they could take the powers from the state and issue a writ, which was essentially a telecommunications uh, license. So we became the only company in the world licensed by a constitutional court to operate a telephone company. And Strive, do so, I recall correctly that part of the theory of the case was the right of the people to receive information? and that the government monopoly blocked that? That's right. So we argued it that the, 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 the provision said every citizen has a right to receive and impart information without hindrance. So we argued that the monopoly constituted a, an offense to the hindrance part. So we had to actually assemble uh, quite an extraordinary legal team came out of South Africa, the United Kingdom, and so forth. And it was Strive Masiwa versus the Republic of Zimbabwe, you know, so. And am it, I right, Strive, that the young lawyer, Nick, who was an associate at the law firm, yeah. is now one of your business partners? That's right. right. In fact, literally the whole legal team that had been assembled, in five years, they only worked on this court case, so they all ended up at the company. And uh, Nick uh, one of his, now runs one of our most successful ventures out of the United Kingdom. But of course, um, having had this battle, the government then says, OK, uh, we will accept that the ruling is in place. We're allowed to operate. And um, I then, literally a year after, that was I count the days, on 22nd of March, 2000, I packed my bags and left the country and I've never been back since. It is 17 years, two days. <laughs> Say a little bit about that. What, why, why haven't you gone back? Well, you know, I thought it was best, uh, allowed things to settle down a bit. Right. 
Um, but uh, I moved to South Africa. And um, the decided that I was to build a completely new business. So literally from scratch, I, start, I left the Zimbabwean business as it was. It was very small at the time. They had 60,000 customers when I left. You know, they have 10 million today. And um, yeah, the so, company still exists. It's, is it, it the oh, largest yeah. or second largest employer in Zimbabwe? No, no, it is. It's the largest, the largest. employer, largest taxpayer, largest everything uh, there. Right. And so it's done. It's done very well. And um, you know, to their credit, the government don't interfere much with its operations, and and they do good work. And Titsi goes back. Strive's wife goes back and runs the, the a lot of the family philanthropy there as Sukti mentioned, supporting tens of thousands of orphans and doing all sorts of other uh, uh, stuff, particularly in the field of education with, with young people. Can I, so Nick and I had dinner about a year ago. It was actually in Dubai. So he gave me a little of the local color. Strive didn't quite tell you. The way he describes it, you can, you can counter if I'm wrong here. So this court case, Strive was a young guy and he was um, one of the small but eminent law firms and they basically thought he was crazy. So they assigned the case to Nick as an associate. That's right. They to gave him it. away from the senior partners and said, Nick, you deal with the guy because we think this is all, uh, this is going nowhere. And, um, and, and yet we kind of like him, but this is, <laughs> this, is not, this is not central to the business of the law firm. So. That's very true. That, right. The, the, you know, uh, I'd sort of go there and, we, the partners were, they, and they remain amazing friends of mine, uh, had an arrangement whereby basically they'd have all the young lawyers. And we would meet on a Friday for lunch. This guy called Mervyn Immerman and, uh, uh, and, his, and his partner. And we would sit there and basically you would say, okay, so what do you think of Strive's case? And this was all I got. This was uh, out of them, you know. They would all furiously take notes, and he. But we went on to uh, to build an incredible uh, legal team from there. How were you paying the bills for the for your young family then? Oh, Tom, don't go there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was tough. Yeah. It was tough. It was, um, you know, it all. When these things happen and take on a life of their own, you sort of forget what it was really like in the trenches, but you know, Nick gave me some sense of that as well. It was really hard. And the government was out to destroy it. So I was making a little bit light of this, but the government was out to destroy him. There was no way that they were gonna let him succeed. And um, so it was sort of against all odds. Um, Strive, talk a little bit about today and Quesi Television and your new enterprise. Well, you know, um we obviously went on to build uh, telecommunications as the sort of telecommunications rolled out across Africa. We became part of that whole revolution. Um, and today, you know, Africa has a population of uh, just under a billion people. 750 million mobile phones. Uh, 200 million are smartphones. So we telephone executives, we're running out of runway uh, as to who else gets a phone next. So, but the big thing now has become how do we leapfrog to television? Um, the, and we believe the future lies in the fact that the mobile phone becomes the television. And in Africa, where the mean age of the African population is 19. Uh, in another interesting statistic, uh, at the turn of the century, uh, Africa's population will be close to four and a half billion. We will be almost half the world's population. And over 60% of the world's kids will be Africans. So That's you know, at the end of the century. The end of the century. Uh, so we, 
we look at it and we say, well, look, the dividend for us comes from how do you capture this, uh, the energy of this young population to create new economies, uh, educate in new ways. Young people adapt very, very quickly. So we have built a, a, uh, a television platform that uh, very similar to your kind of direct TV dish and so forth. But the big difference is that we deliver most of our content straight onto the mobile phone. Uh, and we see that as our primary delivery platform. Uh, so, we, so we, you know, but at the end of the day, it's battles over everything. You, we fight for sports rights. Uh, you know, we, we own a few. <laughs> we own a few of those. And um, say, flash forward five years from now, what, what is the vision as to what this will mean for, for Africa? in terms of the program that's available? Well, look, at the, at the end of the day, we, we want to entertain, obviously. But we want Africa to tell its own story. So a lot of our investment is on original programming. Um, we, we are working very closely with, we just issued um, uh, 40 producers uh, mandates to produce uh, their programming, everything from series, your telenovelas, all around the African story. The other thing in the, the African version of The Sopranos. That, that's that, right. That, yeah, that, yeah. That, we got, got a few HBO going some years We got ago. a few of those. Yeah, yeah. I could use a soprano right yeah. now, you know. Uh, <laughs> but um, we, you know, when you look at that 4.5 billion population. Uh, a billion of them will be Nigerians. Uh, one in four Africans is a Nigerian. Uh, we, so we, and they are producing an extraordinary amount of content. In terms of volume of uh, movies, they actually produce more than Hollywood, except they do it for $10,000 a movie. So we, we kind of trying to nudge up the quality of some of that stuff because you know the reality shows can be ten hours. Uh, that's one episode, so you got to you got to we got to work our way through that. But you know the story is there, um, and these industries. You know you talk of Ni Nigeria. Seventy percent of Nigeria's export revenues come from oil, but the movie industry of Nigeria employs more people. Absolutely. So you, 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 we got to, and so we got to look at these points because we got to create jobs. Mm. And these are the areas where you can uh, create jobs. We'll stay tuned and watch as this <laughs> develops. So Shri, flipping over to the philanthropic part of your life, which is um, uh, extensive to say the least. So a few years back, you had taken over from Kofi Annan is the chair of AGRA, the Alliance for Green Revolution in, in Africa, feeding the continent. And then came Ebola. So talk a little bit about how that changed your life and what, 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 how, how, how you got engaged. Well, you, you, you know, we, uh, President Obama hosted uh, an incredible uh, meeting where he invited African business and African leaders to, to the White House uh, in 2014. And uh, I was there, we were, we were having dinner, and uh, the chair of the African Union never met her. She just came up to me and she said, you know, we need to talk. The following week, she calls me and she says, I need to see you, where are you? I said, well, I'm in London. She said, well, I'm gonna, can you stay there long enough for me to get to you? I said, was that bad? What, what, what's happening? She said, it's Ebola. So she, she came in and we, we met somewhere. And she explained to me the problem they were having, which is the African Union, like the European Union, in fact, it's far much less 
institutional and that they have real, no real power. But what they wanted to do was to send this whole Ebola crisis, as you know, uh, the three little countries in the western part of Africa. Most Africans, if you walk down the street of Johannesburg and you say, do you know where Sierra Leone is? They think it's probably a movie. Uh, it, you know, it's a big continent. And um, the, so the idea was, can we get the African military to donate nurses and doctors? And we could, so we could send them in large numbers to help with this thing. But there was no money, then the African Union had no budget for it. So she asked me to act as an, as an envoy and basically mobilize the, the response to it. And you know, we kind of managed in the end to get about 850 nurses and doctors to fly out there. And we, we managed to get nurses and doctors within the countries themselves. Because everybody thought of putting people into the country. But actually, those countries had a lot of people who were ready to volunteer themselves. And they, it was their crisis. So we paid for a lot of those people to go in and help with the communities. But it was a global effort. And I must say that um, uh, the US led. You know, because at the end of the day, you could get nurses and doctors there, but you needed infrastructure, you needed transport. And President Obama sent 3,500 troops who quickly built hospitals, camps. It, it was an, I, I, I've told him that it's going to, one day, he's gonna, it's going to be like President Bush and Pepfar. Right, right. With you know, everybody right. kind of, you only think of President Bush. Uh, I'm actually going to Botswana with him next week. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, and he, you think of President Bush, but you never think of President Bush's legacy as the man who stopped the spread of HIV AIDS. But in Africa, that's oh, widely yeah. recognized he, and appreciated. He is incredibly popular there because, you know, 42 million people dead with, uh, with HIV AIDS. And he came, you know, he pushed through this program called PEPFAR. $15 billion, the largest amount of US aid in history to deal with a global pandemic, and scotched it. Today, it's almost a chronic disease. So uh, it's an extraordinary thing, because sometimes we think of legacies of presidents in very different ways. Uh, President Bush, uh, for all the things that people can say about him, is a guy who don't mind walking down the street of an African city with. Uh, of course, it's easier to work with President Obama. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good, well, good point. Um, how many, um, at the end of the day, uh, were, were killed by the Ebola virus? Whoa, you know, 27,000 dead. The projecting, projection had been that it will take out one and a half million people within six months. That, that was the clock that we were, we were racing against. So we kind of just dropped everything and no, focused. I remember all of a sudden Strive, with all these things he was doing, business and everywhere, he, he, he dropped it all. And he's downplaying it, as he always does. But this is what he dedicated himself to. And if I understand it correctly, this was the first time uh, because of your leadership, and I'm sure you had some other colleagues, but mostly your leadership, where the private sector engaged with the African Union and then there was this simple but pretty profound thought that we have the military, we have the medical personnel in our various militaries. And it was this public-private effort um, hatched overnight that, that actually uh, uh, was hugely effective. So t talk a little bit then, Strive, about where that's leading now. I know you're spending a lot of time with the African Union trying to institutionalize some of these efforts and get ahead of the curve uh, for next time, both with medical and so no financial stability. Well, you know, I think probably the most exciting part of the whole thing was, was first, it was quite easy to call biggest 
businesses in Africa to a meeting. You pick up the phone, you call GE, you call Coca-Cola. These are big companies in Africa, and they came. It took us half an hour, and I said, guys, this is how many people we need to send, this is how much it costs, da 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 da. We were done, bill paid for, everybody went to their offices. I said, wait, before you go, what we need to do is, why don't we get all the mobile operators together? And let's ask them to set up an SMS number and get people to send 20 cents to the SMS number. And we won't talk about corporate world. We want the Africans to own the response. So we went to every television broadcasting company. We went to every, say, here's an SMS number. It belongs, it is actually now one of the assets of the African Union. It's a crisis number. And 100 million people responded. And they were being asked to pay, to contribute 20 cents. And the idea was simply own the problem. And because that was, because often uh, when we respond, we, when, when there is a global crisis, we kind of push small people away. And we say, you know, when we got to get on with this. But it's, you got to allow people to have an opportunity to own and participate. So it was the first time that Africans felt there was a problem. We solved it. So I said, Shh, don't tell them that they didn't solve it. They solved it. It was their solution. It was their problem. And... Um, and, and I hope that we can use that because we've got a new crisis now, as you know. We've got a major uh, drought uh, that's hit uh, the East African Horn, 20 million people under threat. So we're going to now look at the fabric of can we sustain some of this. Now, the, the, the work led the uh, African governments to say, well, are there other things in the private sector? Um, so a group of us uh, were asked to actually reform, to, to lead an initiative to see how the African Union can be reformed to respond to major crises. Um, and that's number one job at the moment. How's it going? Stuff. <laughs> Politicians don't, All you right. know, stuff. But, but hopefully we can, um, we can, you know, there are a few ideas out there that, you know, different lens. If you, here's a lens you can take away from on Africa. African economy is $2.8 trillion. Same size as India. Population, same size as India, OK? Uh, annual growth is over 5%, has been for two decades. The top perform, out of the top performing uh, 15 economies of the world, three quarters are African, OK? So, so it's a completely different narrative to one which people often would think about, OK? When Nelson Mandela left prison, uh, in 1990, only seven African countries had ever had a regular election. Today, less than seven African countries don't have a regular election, and they mostly sit in North Africa. There's countries like Libya uh, that weren't having elections, and we beat them up for it. So, so th there is progress. Yeah. And it's a big place, so we've got, uh, we've got to take our wins, uh, and we've got to manage uh, major hotspots and major challenges as well, not least of which is how do you create jobs for the kids? Mm. Um, otherwise, the world will know about the problem. Right. That's a good segue to our audience here. How many of you are NYU law students as, as we speak? So as you're thinking about life after, 
I'll give you um, my very simplistic uh, advice when people come to see me starting their careers. And, but, and it's, I really just want it as a lead into what Strive tells young people, which will be more interesting. So I have two things. One, do something you're really passionate about. And two, do it with smart people. And then stuff happens. You know, it's the old adage. I think it's John Lennon. Life is what happens when you're making other plans. You really don't know. I mean, I look back. I could look back in terms of my pro bono interests, and I could have traced that to law school. In terms of business, I would have had no clue. Um, and so a lot of it's serendipity. So, Strive, what do you um, counsel young people who are getting started and are looking at the, you know, the world of commerce and business and law and also the world of uh, uh, the public interest uh, 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 world and the not-for-profit world? What, what, are, what are things that you think are useful to think about? Well, you know, we, we have a, a lot of labels beautiful terms like philanthropy and not for profit, for profit. First thing is throw away the labels. See, I, I knew he'd help me. <laughs> Just get rid of them because philanthropy has nothing to do with having money. It's just the desire to see change, okay? And look for solutions. Um, so you be a philanthropist day one. I mean, we support 40,000 kids, but we didn't say, okay, when we make money, we will support 40,000 kids. Actually, uh, we supported one, and then two. I said, this is $200, $300. We set up a scholarship program, and now we produce Rhodes Scholars like Dalamuzi over there. Uh, and, and you just kind of add on to these things. So, Whatever it is has a lot of space for you to, to go out and make change. Um, the, there is no difference. You, you can't say, well, there's a corporate world. Human rights sits over here. Uh, no, there is no such thing. Human rights apply throughout because people most people live in, we, we spend most of our lives in the workplace. So how can we separate ethics and say it's over here and human rights is over here and, and stuff like that? It's all just life. Just go out, engage. Uh, you know, you can, you can have long plans, but if somebody walks in and says, I need help, and I think you can help, Help. You know, we didn't, I didn't wake up and say, you know, we're going to solve Ebola. I'm going to get. We kept telling uh, the chair of the African Union, as soon as this thing is done, we move on from here. And then you just solve the problems as they come, and that's life. Uh, and you will feel quite fulfilled at the end of it. Uh, and, and hopefully, you have a great career. Um, some questions? So we have some. Back and forth here. Yes. So, <clears throat> thank you, Strive, and um, wonderful stories about both your business career and your philanthropic activities. Can you talk a little bit about how, it, either from from EchoNet, from Unilever, or other companies that you've seen, they are incorporating human rights concerns and sustainability? concerns in their business model. So you end up with a win-win, a and, and it's different from philanthropy. Well, you know, to the, to the extent that I can talk about it, I mean, you all know the Unilever story. It's a huge company of 160,000 employees. Uh, but I went, and I'm on their board, and what drew me to them. More recently, right, Strike? In the last yes, couple of years? Yes, last couple of years. The last couple of years. And, and my, my, what drew me there was the extraordinary commitment to sustainable living, their commitment to uh, how they source, and they source on a global scale and on, on issues that can be quite controversial. But under the CEO, Paul Pullman, 
he has led this in, uh, approach. And we as a board have then sought to institutionalize it. And it's, it's quite a privilege to see how, you know, initially uh, most people thought, well, you know, this is just some crusading kind of left wing, you know, a hippie type CEO still wanting to do something. But the, we now know uh, that an extraordinary amount, we've got studies which show that an extraordinary equity in, of the company comes from that. Hmm. It, is, it is quite extraordinary. I mean, you attend a Unilever annual general meeting and it's almost, okay, thanks for the results. Now let's talk about sustainable living. What are you doing about this? What have you done about this? And so it is, it is not inconsistent with profitability and long-term growth to be concerned about these issues. We find, for example, in the case of Unilever, it is one of the world's top uh, draws for young people leaving universities from around the world. The, the, we get millions and millions of young people mm. applying for jobs from the world's top universities. And they don't come for money. Mm. They tell you immediately, we want to join you because you believe in these things. Because the young people today, they are looking for far much greater purpose and uh, being associated with the values than any generation in history. So, so for those corporate executives looking out, thinking about this out there, this is good for profit. Because mm. if you can draw the brightest young people, it, you know, that's got to be good for business. Mm. So we're beginning to codify to ensure that this is long-term sustainable, and we invite many other corporations to, to, to join us. That's great. And of course, NYU is right there at the forefront, because Michael Posner started a new institute on business and human rights at, at Stern, uh, having spent his life as a lawyer, uh, building Lawyers Committee for Human Rights, Human Rights First, then serving as Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights for Secretary Clinton. He then um, left the legal uh, area proper and came to the business school to start the new Institute for Business and Human Rights. And my sense is, in my generation, when I was at law school, um, law schools didn't have human rights programs and clinics. Now virtually every law school in the United States and many, if not most, around the world have that. I think, led by Mike and others, and with, again, NYU as a pioneer here, the curriculum that he's developing and the program programming that he's developing will take root not only here, but will be a model and will uh, uh, more quickly than, than, than you would think will take hold at business schools in the United States and around the world. And of course, who has also helped Mike get started, Strive. And they've become great friends and um, are, uh, uh, spend a lot of time together talking about these things. Uh, other questions? Yes. Uh, Strive. Uh I was a little stunned by the fact that you mentioned um, that the population will be uh, over 1 billion, uh, excuse me, you said by the end of the century. 4.5 4. billion. 4.5 billion. So I was, I was stunned yeah. by that growth rate, what you're talking about, what you were mentioning here. In light of the, in light of, uh, and, and the overwhelming youth of the particular continent there, in light of the famine that's taking place in East Africa, in light of the number of young people there, in light of the world's at least temporary, hopefully, but the pullback from globalization, the more nationalist movement there, isn't that just an incredible challenge that Africa is heading down the road to? Absolutely. But I'm, I'm not pessimistic. Um, we also have extraordinary generations coming through uh, that are very alive to the challenges in front of us. Um, and are determined to turn this into a dividend. 
uh, if we have no choice, uh, we, we, we have to ensure that uh, we can create the environment within Africa that spurs uh, growth. It's a big continent. So what, what's, what's the world population today? Six and a half billion? Uh, about seven. Huh? Seven billion. Yeah. So, so, the, so the forecasts are a nine billion about global... 11, about 11 at the end of the century. 11. Yeah. And four and a half billion in Africa. Yeah. Jesus, mind boggling. Mind boggling. Yeah, mind boggling. Yes, Mary. So one of the challenges in your business and human rights area is really around corruption uh, in, in governments and in businesses. And, I, and certainly Africa has a reputation that that's a challenge. I wonder if you could comment. Yeah, I, I have a few scars to show. <laughs> you know, uh, it's, uh, I'll give you an uh, anecdotal story. Um, uh, we were involved in a business in Nigeria. And um, we had uh, a massive problem of um, demands for bribes. And um, I refused for the bribes to be paid and walked away. And um, it led to a massive lawsuits, which uh, took 10 years to, to settle. We had to go through international arbitration over our assets. And we won in all the arbitrations. <coughs> Um, but the interesting thing was I got a phone call one day from our lawyers in London and they said, you know, the British Serious Fraud Squad would like to have a call meeting with you. But don't be scared. They think you're a friend. That's it's a very assuring statement, you know. <laughs> so I flew to London and met with these detectives. And they said to me, um, we're trying to trace a movement of money that came out of Nigeria. After you left the business, there were these massive transfers that were taking place involving foreign European and international firms. Uh, we're driving bribes, what we believe, these, these were proceeds of corruption. Uh, and I said, fine, I, I'll help you. What do you need to know? So we, they said, well, we raided the offices of these British companies. And these are some of the documents we found. But we can't interpret them. I said, I'll help you with that. <laughs> I said, I know that drawing. I know that document. I know that structure. The cut long story short is um, it ended up with uh, a Nigerian governor of a state being arrested uh, by Interpol in Dubai and flown to Britain for trial. Mm. And I was principal witness in his trial. Mm. 70 witnesses. I was the only one willing to speak. And on the night of his trial, uh, I, you know, I had to, I spent several weeks as a uh, witness to, they call witness to the crown. And uh, on the night of his trial, uh, I was preparing to go into the dock, uh, and I was told that he's pleaded guilty. Hmm. And he got 13 years. Wow. He's just been released. And uh, the, the lawyers and the bankers, first time ever in history that they got to the lawyers and the bankers. Wow. Because it is always there. And that, that's where the most difficult piece happens. You know, this corruption, it doesn't take place in Africa. It takes place in Geneva, London, New York. Because that's where the clever stuff is done. And let me tell you, it's very difficult for African governments to pursue these kind of people. Mm. Because it just, that's why it's so important to have uh, 
uh, international legislation like Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, the British Anti-Bribery Act, because you need access to the machinery of the US Justice Department. Those guys, they can pursue anybody. The British, they can pursue. The government in Nigeria, for all the goodwill, they knew those guys were corrupt. They couldn't come anywhere near them. And it needed that kind of effort. And, and, the, and I said to you, it takes two to tango. Corruption doesn't happen in Africa. The real corruption is, not, is happening between two sides. There's a little stuff, the policeman wanting a bribe on a street corner. OK, you know, you've got to stamp that stuff out. But the real stuff where Africa uh, is, 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 is being so terribly undermined and the work, uh, the poverty underpinned, unfortunately, involves really, really smart people. And th that's why we've got to teach ethics beginning in the major institutions of the world. Mm. Uh, you tackle it there, there's no one who can get it done on the other side. Yeah, and that leads back a lot to the law schools and the business schools mm. of the world. And, and, uh, and that's why I'm always yeah. so keen to yeah, support, yeah, because yeah, yeah. I know what I've gone through you know, to, yeah, yeah. to get a prosecution like that done. Yeah. Yeah. Sharon. Yeah, thank you so much, Tom and Chai, for really wonderful stories and encouragement. Such a struggle is worth it, and you even win sometimes. Um, I uh, wanted to hear, um, I was in the Orlando airport last week, and the first thing I see when I got off the plane was a big Huawei sign, and it said, Huawei, providing 90% of the cell phones for you, like all of Sweden. And I think there's a narrative about um, China's footprint in Africa, and particularly in the sector in which you know, you've really been working both business and then also in human rights related. I, I'd be really interested in hearing your observation. Have you felt any case of that footprint? Um, what, what has, you know, in the culture area, I think there's lots of Confucius Institutes in uh, Africa and it's presenting a very partial version of history globally as well as you know, regionally. But if, do you have any, um, I'm really interested in any observations on that footprint. Uh, and because of the telecommunications industry being all state-owned in China, and they really have regional and global aspirations, uh, both structurally, infrastructure, hardware, software, everything, services sector also. Uh, you know, I'll tell an anecdotal on Huawei. This must be off. 15, 20 years ago, our engineers were preparing to choose a, a supplier for one of our networks. So they go through the process of selecting the different companies. You had Motorola, Lucent, and uh, these American companies, and Swedish, Ericsson, and so on. And they bring the bids to me for my final review. And I said, I seen the discount documents from the Chinese company Huawei. Where is their offer? Because there was a separate document which said, which worked out to be 10% of the value of the others. They said, that is the offer. Hmm. They were 10% hmm. of the price hmm. of all the other companies. And I said, is this real? They said, yes. I said, OK, get us on the plane to China. So we headed to China to see their factory. And they were the biggest factories we'd ever seen in the world. And we didn't know they existed. Mm. There were these monsters. What year is this drug? This would be, goodness me, maybe. 98, 99, thereabout. And we're beginning to see the Chinese arrive. OK? Um, within five years, no American suppliers on the African continent are gone. We haven't seen Motorola now for a long, long time. We don't know what happened to Lucent, the Nortel. 
we, they disappeared. The Europeans were pushed out. I think that statement of 90% doesn't apply to Africa. It's 100% Chinese. They took control of our industry supply. And the thing was, whether it was us or Vodafone or whoever, AT&T, we made a ton of money. We were very excited to be buying equipment at that at sort of price levels. OK, so, so that's one side of looking at, because you know, that was their strength. OK, but I can't, but we must never get it out of perspective. The business between the, 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 the business between the U.S. and Africa is much deeper. The relationships are much deeper. The, 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 the diversity of the things that we do together are much deeper. Okay, so, you know, uh, if you ask most people, so Coca-Cola, it's, it's a local company. Uh, they don't, you know, the, the Chinese don't have an equivalent. So, so if you're looking for Nike shoes, or you know, our kids are still looking for Nike and uh, American brands. It's, it's so I, I don't think that whilst the Chinese have, this, have their areas of capability, uh, in the broad sense, uh, it has been additive and, and helpful. Uh, their work in infrastructure, for instance, uh, roads and bridges and railways, areas which uh, Western investors long stayed away from. The Chinese have found ways to participate in those areas. And much of that happens government to government. And of course, I'm not qualified to speak in that space because I just don't know what goes on. I read a lot, I hear a lot. Um, but if you go to the African populace and you're seeing a new road or a new railway line and so forth, you know, this is considered uh, a good relationship. And I think that certainly given the changes that have taken place in the United States, you're going to see an X uh, 2.0 engagement between Africa, China, Africa, and India. Right. There is already a incredible. What surprised me is the speed. Hmm. Uh, that there's a sense that whoa, there's a change a over there. We we got to, and the Chinese are are in there. Okay, uh, so that is going to be one of the consequences. Of, uh, of the change. Mm. Uh, and there are major implications that we can discuss across a whole broad range of issues. Good, how about one last question and then uh, on we go. Yes. Um, I was wondering, in terms of corporate responsibility and participation in human rights and social issues, um, what are the pressure points that get some of these corporations to be more public and supportive and do the right thing with good, good um, corporate business partners on the safe issues, but on things that may be more politically controversial, um, racism, uh, the emission standards in the big car companies, the changes. I'm just curious about your view on that. <coughs> The, the, the key thing for us is, and here I take my corporate hat off and become an activist, I, because I sometimes do that in the morning and then I do it in the evening. Uh, so let me become an activist for a moment. The answer always lies in our push for transparency. You know, that, that's, that's where you gotta, we always gotta focus, always keep pushing for transparency, whether it is the corporate sector, even governments. Mm. We get our best results when we push for transparency. And the pressure point always comes. I mean, and, you know, and I, I think Tom will agree with me here. You know, we kind of look at you guys and your generation with envy. 
because the tools available to you today, mm. your, social, your, your social media tools, your ability to mobilize, it's, it's been so democratized. Mm. I mean, for the things that Tom's dad and them had to do in the 70s, just to get uh, them, the world to know that there is a particular guy in, in Russia who is being persecuted. It could take years just to get, to get that name out there. You guys can do it in a moment. Mm. So, so the key is to use these tools to mobilize and network yourselves globally and, 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 and address, because there is no government which can, or, or corporate, which can ever withstand the indignation of the populace right. or customers. And so so the, 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 it's not about where you come from. The VW is German. You know, they're supposed to be, you know, they do things right, but they could hide it, <laughs> you know? So, so, the, so there is nowhere where the standard, we all just got to remain absolutely vigilant. Yeah. And, and, and it's whether, you don't think because it happened uh, 50 years ago, it can't happen again. We can still have genocides in our time. There's more killing taking place right now that we thought we are now in the age of enlightenment. Think again. You know, so, so we, we just got to remain vigilant and use the tool. Right. There's you. a great uh, Br Justice Brandeis quote on transparency, which is sunlight is the best disinfectant. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so we just well. got to keep pushing and using these tools that are at our disposal uh, to, to keep fighting back. Well, Strive, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, conclude by thanking you on behalf of everybody and just saying that, you know, um, you. Uh, you know, we, we marvel look at all the things you do as a citizen of the world, but the great thing for New York is you've become so much a part of NYU. So I guess we owe that to Sarah in part. And uh, we're all really grateful, Stry. So thank, thank you. you.